Hi, everybody. My name is Jill Bisbee, and I am your student success officer in the College of Education and Human Services, and that is the Oates College for your major, being a physical education teacher in K through 12 grades. And hello, I am uh, Dr. Richie Gobai. I am the program director for the physical education teacher ed program. I teach a number of the courses. I will be one of your biggest advocates. My job is to see you through and, and get you licensed and get you a job. How do students even know if being a PE teacher is the right path for them? Well, I know this from experience, um, somewhat my personal experience as well as it's in the literature, in the research literature, that uh, people choose to be a PE teacher because they love sports. They love the content. Um, they love the notion of sharing with another person how to perform that skill and, um, and, and that enables the other person. You, and, and we do this with kids. And a lot of teachers just love it. The, the, their best days are when that kid gets it. Um, and or they see the light bulb come on over a kid's head. And, 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 and suddenly they're able to do that skill or do that strategy or concept. And that's one of the biggest reasons, because we love the content. Um, other reason is uh, that they love kids. They want to be around kids. They love the school environment. They want to do that for the rest of their lives. Some teachers have had terrible teachers in the past, and they want to right the wrong. They, they want to level the playing field. Uh, but what I, want, what I always say is with people trying to decide their future, that regardless of what you choose as a degree program, just decide what you're going to do for the not next five to 10 years, not the rest of your life. Um, I was a PE teacher for almost nine years, almost 10 years. And um, then I went into higher education. Same sort of thing, but a little different. So uh, don't put your pressure on, on your, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Just the next five, 10 years. That makes sense. Yeah. The rest of your life is a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. I like that approach. Can you tell us um, what a typical day being a PE teacher in a school might be like? Because I'm sure that there are probably some parts that as students on the receiving end of what a PE teacher does, there's probably additional things uh, that we were not aware of that a PE teacher does. Absolutely, and that's one of the things we do very first uh, in this program is try to move our new students, our freshmen, uh, to the other side of the clipboard, so to speak, um, uh, to, to the, pull the curtain on old Oz and, uh, and, and, and see what it's like in the real world for being a PE teacher, because as students, they make it look easy. So typically, you know, depending upon your school, depending upon what, uh, um, what you have going and how motivated you are to make changes and that sort of thing, typically arrive at school anytime between 7, 7.30. Some schools don't, will have a later starting time. We're seeing that in the literature, that it's later starting times uh, produce better academics. So it may be 8, 8.30. But uh, right now, the majority of schools you need to be there at 7.30. Contract says you need to be there a half hour before students. And uh, you'll spend, a, you know, that first half hour getting your equipment ready, getting to the uh, uh, equipment closet and getting your gear out uh, along with all your colleagues. They're trying to do the same thing and you're setting up your space. To, uh, to have class and you pretty much do that for the rest of the day, that cycle of set up, teach, take down, set up, teach, take down. And, and you get a couple things done, maybe you plan for practice. And then about 2.30, three o'clock, you're off, you're off to, uh, to practice, you know, um, because you'll, you're going to be the best prepared teacher in the district to coach and they're going to want to coach want you to coach quite a bit uh, because you're the best prepared the motor skills strategies uh, tactics 
uh, that sort of thing, uh, the safety of all of that, you're the best prepared. And so, um, and then, you know, you'd be in practice, depending on when that is, if you have to rotate schedules, it could be late nights. And um, these are long days, but let me tell you, it's, uh, um, you get done, you get done with a day and you sit down and you, and you process good, the bad, the hard, the funny, and there's a lot of funny, kids do crazy things. And the best thing, my high school football coach, when he retired, he said, the best thing about education is that every day is different. Every day is an adventure. And that's because of the kids and they, they, they make it that way. They're fun. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm not saying there's not ups and downs um, and confusing parts and decisions. Decisions are the hard part. Making decisions is the hardest part of the job. And you do, you do them a lot. You make decisions a lot. And sometimes they're big decisions. Sometimes there's a whole bunch of little ones. It, it is rewarding, especially when they come back and you get to see them years later and see how they turned out. You know, a lot of that is them, the students, not you. Sometimes it is. And uh, they talk about the great times that they've had in, with you in class, um, the things that they're doing, and that makes it rewarding. Tell us a little bit about how the curriculum prepares students, n- not only pass the licensure exam for being a teacher, but prepares you for those kinds of things, a strong um, teacher in this context. All of our assignments in the PEAT courses are set up to achieve a, a goal. So there is no busy work. There is no, you know, there's the, there's, there's, you're doing, in our program, you're doing a lot of your own work. Uh, I'm not a big believer in reading the text and doing the exam, listening to the lecture and doing, and then studying your notes and taking an exam. I, um, our program is built on the notion of authentic assessment. Uh, that means do, assessing the student's progress um, through authentic measures set in situations that are as authentic as can be, uh, as realistic as possible, given the, given the stage. Sometimes that's teaching your peers. Sometimes it's turning in assessment plans. That um, Other times it's in the schools teaching real kids. The assignments are set up um, using a PE notion of um, environmental design. Uh, that notion is if you design the environment, to elicit the student response, the learner response, and they do it often and they will learn. They will learn it and and be able to do it. And so we do the same thing with the assignments. We prompt you to respond regarding this theory, this concept, this construct, this behavior, and you put in what you need to put in to the best of your ability, explaining it in as much detail as possible then you implement it. That notion is set up over and over and over and over and over and over again so that by by the end you become pretty solid in in um, those behaviors that are going to be make you a good teacher. Um, it's actually based upon uh, Anders Ericsson's theory of deliberate practice. Google that deliberate practice and see the list of things that have to happen um in a deliberate practice learning situation if you had a successful athletic experience at some point you'll recognize the fact that yep that's what my coaches do so and that's the way that's the way we look at our program here is that we're not just weeding out the chaff we're not finding who's going to be good and, and and not good we believe everybody can be good we believe and and, and everybody's on the team I'm, I'm the coach, and I want every one of my players to have a role on the team. This is the way I coached when I was, when I was younger. Everyone has a role on the team, and everybody gets to contribute, and everybody's going to be successful. It's my job to get you there. And we use deliberate practice and environmental design uh, as part of that for y'all becoming teachers as well as when we teach. Can you share with us um, just a few examples of some assignments of how that approach is put into practice. 
Sure. Well, the lesson plans and the lesson plans are, are primarily set up that way. Uh, it's the same lesson plan format from your very first teaching opportunity to the very last. They just build upon each other. We start simple with a few simple things like your learning objective, your learning experiences, practice tasks. And that sort of thing. And then we add assessments and then we ask task presentations. And then we add, you know, what, all kinds of things as you get to the end. Um, it gets pretty complex. Um, but it's the same format. It just builds. It's like, it, we're, it's like building an onion. You know, we just add another layer every time. We had great success with all of that in, in secondary methods. Our students used assessment. They put kids into skill groups, and they had a lot of success um, um, achieving the objective. You know, we don't teach you how to write lesson plans. We teach you how to teach. The lesson plan is just how you get started because it's a plan, and that's it, because it always changes. You get in the middle of a lesson, it always changes, and it should based upon the needs of your students. So that's one. The EdTPA, we do two EdTPAs in the program. We practice it. Now that's the licensure um, exam for Illinois and many other states is this large portfolio. It has um, three parts, um, the, the context, the, plan, the planning, the implementation of the planning, and then the assessment and how you interpret the results. Uh, and so you get two opportunities to do them in preparation for the final ed TPA during st student teaching. We have some assignments, motor clinic um, for adapted physical education, where you get to work with developmental uh, students with developmental disabilities. Uh, there's also a chance to work with developmental uh, milestones and developmental needs of preschoolers at the uh, local uh, daycare through a motor development course. And that's really interesting because you have to identify the milestones that they have and the milestones that they're working toward. What are the, what are the factors that they're working with physically and try to create practice tasks that will improve their development. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, Dr. Boris does an, an amazing job. Um, there's some time that we do a lot of team building games in the very first semester. It tends to be everyone's favorite. We have a really good time. We get to know each other really well. Um, and it starts with those team game, team building games. Um, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna brag and toot my whistle a little bit here that I'm probably the best at doing this in most of the state of Illinois. Um, I've had years and years and years and years of practice. And I know everybody's been through team building games, but um, not like this. You're going to have an experience where you get to know each other. You're going to laugh. You're going to giggle. You're going to, you're, <laughs> it, um, you get to get to know each other. Um, and then you're going to get a chance to teach some of those games. And that's what becomes really fun. It's like all my students go through and they're like, I have so much fun playing those games. This is great. And then they get to do it that you get to do it. And you get to teach those fun games and have everybody laugh and giggle and maybe it's tense and that oh don't kick that cone don't kick that oh and it's a, it's a fun time. I know another major major assignment here in our in our many content knowledge courses uh, is the notebooks. You take notes on how to shoot a jump shot, how to dribble, how to all of this sort of thing and. Uh, and there's a great amount of details based upon the uh, research coming out of Ohio State University by Phil Ward, uh, that these are the components for specialized content knowledge of physical education teachers. And so you keep that, that notebook into the future that you can refer to it. And it'll be a really good start for you. I'm not going to promise you that Oh, you're going to look at this and wonderful in the future. And it's like, I know just what to do. No, they're pretty bare bones. You're a student. You're learning the, you're learning the, the craft. You're learning the science. Um, but it becomes a really good 
place to start when you're planning, when you're actually in student teaching or in your job, you can open it up and you can say, well, maybe it's just one thing. I got this one kid, I don't know what to do. Um, I did, nothing seems to work. So you go back to the notebook and there's a page on accommodations there. And, oh, that's it, I can do that. And that's gonna fix it. There are some exams, but there's a lot of assignments that uh, where you get to show what you know through your own work. The physical appearance of, of Brophy Hall is really nice. Um, it's named after a physical educator, a professor in a physical education, Kathleen Brophy. And uh, she is one of the pioneers of um, physical education going back into the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, I run into some of her alumni at the State Association and um, just have a great time hearing old stories. Uh, so, but it's a, it's a fairly new building. The, the appearance is great. Um, carpeted classrooms, nice desks and chairs. Gym is fabulous. Um, we can have, you could probably have five lessons going on at the same time and basketball practice at the, on the Eastern court. Uh, so uh, it's big space. And as a PE teacher, I looked at, you know, what had, I had one gym, um, a pool and a uh, cramped locker room that also served as the weight room. So I saw this big gym and I thought, oh, daddy-o, this is where I'm going to live. So um, we've got great space. You'll be about 10 to 16 students in a class, um, in most, especially the beginning of the, the, your first classes. There are larger sections in the kinesiology core courses. Now these are the, the kinesiology core courses I haven't talked about, but these are cool. I mean, we're talking motor learning and motor uh, control, um, how the body, learns and performs motor skills from a scientific perspective. There's anatomy and physiology, of course. And after that course, after you have that anatomy and physiology course, you can have intelligent conversations with your doctor. I am not kidding. Uh, uh, the, and so um, there's the sports psychology course that's uh, really interesting to talk about motivation, anxiety, all those sorts of things uh, regarding performance and what makes kids want to be in your PE class and want to play, want to perform? Um, there is exercise physiology, um, a, lot of, a lot of fitness testing. Many of my students this semester had that class and they were talking about all the fitness tests. And um, these are VO2 max tests and they're going at it, sweat running down and pretty fun. And then uh, biomechanics, you know, the physics part of, of movement. And uh, um, it, it gets to be pretty fascinating, the, the science stuff. And so some of those classes will be lecture lab and lecture exam. Um, those, and they'll be larger. Rest of uh, the program, you're gonna do a lot of your homework uh, and, and authentic assessments. When I'm thinking about uh, the courses that our students will take in the major, and then they're all leading to the student teaching. But I imagine that there's probably some opportunities because you, you've started to allude to some of them um, where our students get to start practicing their craft early mm -hmm. on, well before they're doing their student teaching in their final semester. Can you tell us a little bit about some more about those hands-on experiences where they're working with students perfecting their skills as a teacher? Sure, yeah, uh, and yeah, we have some peer teaching that you do. We have some of those, uh, those situations like in adapted PE and motor development, but there are, there's gonna be, um, starting next semester, we did a little bit of a change. We've always had plenty of time to teach in the, in the schools, but um, now there's more. We have two methods courses. That's the teaching methods. And each of those methods classes have a 40-hour field experience 
that is co-requisite. In other words, it's attached to it. It's a separate class, but held at the same time. So element, uh, elementary methods, you're going to be in class, maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays in, on campus, and then Mondays and Wednesdays, you're out in, out in the field for four hours or, or two hours or whatever it is. And, and so at the same time, so there'll be about 20 hours at the primary school um, that they'll get to, get to teach. That'll be about um, um, four to eight lessons that they'll get a chance to teach. And then another 20 hours at either the middle grades or the preschool. We're going to try and do the preschool because we're now actually, according to the state, a pre-kindergarten pre through 12 licensure program. And then we do the same thing with secondary methods. With secondary methods, same association, you're in class Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, you're, you're in the field for the same amount of time. And there'll be 20 hours at the high school, 20 hours at the junior high. You will write lesson plans, implement those lesson plans, um, reflect upon them. That's the assignments. You will reflect upon them, write up. How did you think it went? Well, I was good at this and I was pretty good at that. And this kid was great. Um, but I, I didn't do very well here doing this one thing. And I need to work on that in the future. So it's that reflective cycle of plan, implement, reflect that helps us get to where we need to be. And that's the part of the deliberate practice model. The teachers in the classes are my former students, our former students. So um, we have a pretty good relationship. A car is an advantage uh, in this program, but it's not necessary. I, I, I work it out, get everybody a ride, everybody gets a partner, everybody's, you know, they get rides to wherever they need to go. You're likely to be employed before you start student teaching. And there's a number of schools in the area that gotten together and said, hey, let's just hire them for student teaching and then keep them. And there they will pay them as a long-term substitute while they're doing their student teaching and once they pass, they become um, a full-fledged teacher the very next semester. That's how much um, schools uh, want our kids, number one. Uh, as a matter of fact, the one in Bushnell, he did his field experience over there. Teacher and the kids and the principal liked him so much and he did such a good job that halfway through field experience, they hired him. I hear from our alumni who have our student teachers, they said, just keep sending them to us. Uh, we only want to work with Western teachers, uh, from, teachers from WIU. We know what they know. We know what they can do. And that's who we want to work with. But all the stuff you taught us in, in classes, I use it all the time. I use it my first year at work. And um, they're, having a, they're just having a great time. A lot of our student teachers will go home and live at home, save some money, and then teach in a school near them, um, near where their home is. Other times you can stay here uh, in Macomb. And uh, like say, if you're an athlete or you've got a job, we've had uh, one of our alumni get, do student teaching in Colorado. So when you think about this whole process of taking the classes and all these field experiences in the student teaching, um, how, how do you know that our students are well prepared? You're getting the feedback from their supervisors and their student teaching and all these field experiences. They're getting the feedback from their peers, from their faculty members like you. Um, how do they perform in the licensure process how do they perform in their careers? I've got, I've got books that are tutorials that will help you prepare. And you know, everybody talks about these standardized exams that say um, that you, you, can't, you can't study for those standardized exams. Yeah, you can. And uh, so we get you prepared to pass those. 
Um, the Ed TPA, it'll come back starting next spring. The governor's emergency declaration goes through next fall. And so we work very hard, even in student teaching, to get you to pass those first time. Some don't, and we, ha we help them and everybody gets through. But here's the bottom line. And, it, and it's a simple equation that if you go to class, if you do your work, you will graduate, get a license, and get a job. 